hi this is Kevin welcome to my lecture on chapter 7 of the Spurrier and Topi systems analysis and design uh, text chapter 7 is about identifying development options all right um so uh, these slides always uh, begin with learning objectives. I leave those for you to read on your own. Okay. Um, so uh, this is uh, chapter seven of the textbook. And uh, in the current semester in my class, this is actually the second of the chapters that we're uh, covering. And I, I think it's going to be pretty, it, it's going to be further up front than it's actually physically located in the textbook in any class that I'm going to teach. And this really has to do with um, the importance of understanding uh, just what kind of systems analysis project you're going to be working on. Um, questions ab about what kind of approach are we going to take? Are we going to take a, uh, a sort of a plan driven traditional approach to systems analysis or are, is, are we going to take the agile approach? Those are really affected by well what kind of project is this? Right? So now we're getting in, into the question, how variable are these kinds of projects? And the answer is highly variable, okay? So uh, pretty early on, you want to be uh, kind of searching around and trying to figure out what kind of a project this is if you and your colleagues are going to do it, okay? Um, so here's some key questions about the sourcing of systems uh, capabilities, kind of like where do systems come from? So for a particular system that we're thinking about, which elements of the system would be specifically developed uh, for the user organization, which have already been uh, developed or will be developed to be shared, right? Are we just, are we gonna build a custom app application for just the client we're talking about? Or are we going to try to get them involved in some kind of a shared software solution? Okay. Um, and a lot of people would think of this, uh, are we going to buy it or are we going, we're going to build it? So it's a buy versus build uh, kind of question. Uh, then whatever we're doing, who's going to employ the people? We're pretty generous here on the slide. We call them experts. Who's going to employ the people who design, develop, and or configure the system. Is it going to be people from outside the organization or is it going to be our, our own employees? Okay, and then on top of that, uh, where are the people who are going to be working on the project, where are they going to be located? Uh, are, they, are they all going to be, is this a small off organization that everybody's going to be in the same place okay um or is this large enough uh that people might be located all over the world okay and all of these things are going to have some important um they're going to be important considerations for just what kind of project this is uh, going to be. Okay, so uh, back in ch uh, chapter one, uh, we showed you this uh, graphic 
which we see again here. I'll try to make it a little bigger. And this is the graphic of, oh, kind of the way the Spurientopi see uh, the system's development process. Okay. And um, it more or less goes from top to bottom and then from within that from left to right. And they have initial visioning, business analysis, and then uh, project planning and implementation approach selection. So that's where we are now. And um, the three things that they have here are identify options for project implementation, select external vendors and products, determine sources and costs of resources. Now, um, I'm going to say that when I look through this part of the plan, um, these are pretty much project management considerations. And I'm not, I'm not going to say that the systems, and that the systems analyst is not interested in project management considerations. But uh, one focus I try to take in this uh, course is to to be focusing on the issues that the systems analyst is primarily responsible for. So some of these uh, some of these uh, decisions about the implementation approach are certainly not exclusively the responsibility of the systems analyst. Um, people who would consider themselves to be project managers would probably even think that they would be more responsible for these kinds of uh, considerations. Be but because they affect what this project is going to be, you know, how it's, how is it going to be um, uh, configured? These are certainly things that the systems analyst is concerned about. Uh, okay, we didn't get off of that slide. Okay, so what are the kind of ways that software that our clients are going to use might be either uh, developed or acquired? Okay, the first one and the one that people think of most often is the development of custom proprietary software solutions. So this is a one-off application created just for this client okay the next alternative licensing licensing commercially available software solutions okay so um in the textbook they talk about this uh as a cots c-o-t-s commercial off-the-shelf software uh, okay some kind of a software package or some uh, a collection of software packages that um, um, you know that can uh, can be acquired uh, together okay maybe open source uh, software possibly the integration or of some or all of these uh, possibilities okay so um, the, the point that we're making here is, is that um, we're well past the days where every piece of software has to be a custom application created for a particular uh, client. Okay, that might be the way that we want to do it. It might not. Okay, so we're going to have to uh, decide. Okay, I think I better shrink this so that we can go from slide to slide a little more peacefully. Okay, so why would you want to develop custom one-off application software for this particular uh, client? Okay, one of the things, one of the justifications that we could use is we wanted to achieve distinctive or even unique organizational capabilities with the systems 
based on the software to support a unique mission and strategy. Okay, so um, one of the things that they talk about when you go to business school is uh, you have to decide of all the things that your organization is going to do, which of them are going to be the ways that you're going to uh, distinguish yourself from your uh, competitors um, and create some uh, strategic advantage. And which of those things are going to be things that uh, you just want to do reasonably well. So if you do them as well as your uh, competitors, uh, that's fine. That's not where you want to compete. Okay. So one of the things that we're saying is that we may want to create our own software just for this uh, client if this is where they want to compete and they want to be different and they think they can get advantage from that. Okay. Um, one insight that the text has is uh, at the next point, collecting forms of customer data that uh, competitors do not have access uh, to. Uh, the authors have seen that in the current systems climate, there's a lot of uh, economic advantage gained by uh, getting uh, data from customers uh, what their choices are, how they shop, um, all those kinds of things, uh, and somehow uh, mining that data, okay? So uh, it might be that by uh, creating our own software, uh, it gives us access, uh, it gives us the opportunity to collect information about uh, customers that we wouldn't otherwise have, and maybe our competitors uh, don't have. Maybe all of the competitors are using the same old uh, package uh, software solution, uh, uh, and because of that, they're kind of doing whatever that activity is, they're all doing it the same way. But one insight that the authors have here is, yeah, and they all have the same access to the data regarding uh, customers. Maybe we might want to write our own software just so we could get a sneakier peek at customer uh, behavior. Okay, that's probably something that's going to sell really well and, and a... Uh, uh, marketing course um, here at uh, the School of Information Sciences. Yeah, maybe we'll take a dim view of that, but it's an interesting point. Um, we might not be able to find the kind of software that we're looking for on the market, okay? Uh, either because what we're trying to do is too complex um, or maybe we're the first uh, people who thought of it. Maybe certain of our competitors have applications like this, but nobody's uh, uh, created and marketed a software package that we can buy. Okay, so it's not really there for us to buy. And in certain circumstances, uh, it might turn out that it, developing this thing internally is uh, cheaper. This is more likely to be true if um, if the the capability that we're looking for is only available as part of some larger product, right? So. Um, uh, if we want to buy it from the outside, we have to buy a kind of large, fancy version that's integrated with a lot of other things. Uh, but if we build it ourselves, uh, uh, you know, we're going to build a stripped down, simpler version. It's going to be a lot less expensive than having to buy a bigger product and only using a small part of it. Um, so what are the costs and risks of 
uh, develop our own, developing our own custom proprietary software solution. Well, it's often expensive. Okay, um, there's a lot of things that make it expensive. It's typically uh, software is is uh, you know designed by people who have high salaries. It's written and tested and installed by people who have high salaries. So there are a lot of people costs and they're expensive people costs. Uh, the next thing is that once we create our own software, it's not only the cost of creating it, but we have to, we have to commit to maintaining it over time. Okay. And uh, one point that they're making here is that we may have to react quickly to environmental uh, changes, such as legal and regulatory uh, changes. One of the first uh, two early uh, software applications that uh, were available as uh, software uh, packages uh, to be bought were accounting software and payroll software. Uh, and they both had that kind of uh, legal and regulatory edge. Um, laws would be passed uh, where employers had to do certain things for payroll and they had to be in uh, compliance very quickly. Uh, Accounting rules would be changed. Companies would have to get into compliance uh, quickly. It was a real advantage for those uh, companies that had picked a software package vendor uh, who had the capability to respond to the legal and regulatory changes. Well, the, the, they could just, you know, kind of, ride along with the work and the expertise of the vendor. Um, there are a lot of risks associated with creating new software. Um, one that we've talked about a bit in this uh, course, even though we're uh, kind of at the beginning of it, is um, the risks associated with understanding the requirements. You know, if you get the requirements wrong, even if you do a really good job of building the product, well, then you've uh, successfully built a product that doesn't uh, solve the problem or capitalize on the opportunity. And um, ability to hire competent staff, um, it is often hard to hire the kind of people that it takes to... Uh, understand the requirements, uh, do a good uh, design, uh, implement the software, test it, install it, and all those things. Those people are uh, highly paid people. Um, they are often hard to come by, right? What if we decided that we want to license a commercially available, uh, available software solution? So some kind of software packages uh, thing. Well, um, there are three categories of software that you would buy from the outside. Uh, and when you kind of understand the market, you can kind of see what these are. So we have these large um large scale enterprise systems okay um we have erp uh systems crm and scm so erp is uh uh enterprise resource uh planning okay uh, CRM is customer relationship management. Um, SCM is supply chain management. 
So these are a collection of more than one application available from the same vendor. Um, typically, um, the typical uh, pitch from the vendor is, we've built this suite of highly integrated products that solves a big portion of your system's needs. And you just have to buy them from us, buy the entire suite, okay, uh, configure them, and your life will be easy, okay? Uh, these kinds of large-scale enterprise uh, systems, adopting them and configuring them and changing your company around to take advantage of them is a major effort, okay? Some of these ERP uh, projects have gone well. Some of them go have gone particularly poorly, okay? But a lot of software, interrelated applications, if you're going to buy the whole thing, it's a major commitment. And it could be uh, the configuration of the software and the installation would easily be a multi-year uh, commitment. It wouldn't be hard to say um, if you were going to commit to and implement uh, a big ERP system that you might do it over three to five years. So big deal. Okay, specialized systems for industry verticals. Uh, certain industries have software providers that who provide applications um, uh, that that do a lot um, a lot of the systems work for that industry. Um, there's a uh, there is a company that has a solution for hospitals called Epic. Uh, and if you go to the hospital, you might see their screensaver. Uh, okay. So there are uh, uh, providers for hospitals, for uh, auto dealerships, for um, all kinds of things, right? And then we have, so those are typically called those, those things that are aimed at a particular industry are called verticals, right? And then we have traditional package software, um, and a lot of people call that horizontal. So this is an application that would apply across industries uh, in like something like uh, general ledger and accounting software or payroll or some kind of human resources application, okay? Um, the people who sell the package say that it will work across a number of industries. So that's horizontally. Um, now, if you're going to use these uh, commercially available solutions, well, how are you going to run them? Well, one way to do it is, it, 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 is that you license software, you get a copy, you install it on your own computer, and you run it right next to the software that you wrote yourself. Um, that's called on-premises or on-prem, okay? Um, you might do cloud-based infrastructure, okay? okay so you're running it right next to your applications, but you don't have uh, hardware. You are, you are, uh, all of your computing is run on uh, someplace like, um, oh, Amazon Web Services or, uh, Microsoft Azure or uh, something like that. And then the third alternative is a thing that we call software as a service. And the one um, the, the one software 
application that I think of that they've been very successful. Uh, Salesforce.com. So they have uh, a suite of applications that uh, helps your uh, Salesforce. And uh, when you sign up with them, uh, you just uh, you use their service, you use their cloud-based uh, uh, computing, and uh, you just, you know, you buy uh, a thousand seats of uh, Salesforce.com, uh, uh, something like that, software as a service, okay? So, um, all those ideas uh, lead us to the traditional uh, matrix, okay? The matrix uh, across the top is uh, COTS uh, type, commercial off-the-shelf software uh, type. So enterprise systems, specialized solutions, traditional package software. And then down the rows, we have whether you're installing it on premises, whether you're installing it in some kind of a cloud, that IaaS is infrastructure as a service. And then the last one, uh, are you simply using systems in the cloud like salesforce.com, which they call sales, uh, I'm sorry, system as a service, S-A-A-S. And the arrows that they're showing is saying that um, if you look at what organizations are doing, um, if they're moving away from, even when they're using these uh, packaged, you know, COTS software solutions, um, they're less likely than they previously were to run them on premises, and they're more likely uh, to be interested in some kind of a deal where they simply sign up and use it as a service. So that's a trend. Is everybody doing that? No, but there's movement in the market in that direction. Um, so a lot of people would think, well, if we can license a commercial product to solve the needs of whoever our client is, well, that's going to be easy, right? And uh, we've finally gotten to the point where we're saying, uh, well, it might be, uh, it might be easier. It might be the path of least resistance, but it's not easy, okay? Because there's a lot of activities that have to go on, okay? One is um, there's some construction that has to be done, okay? And that really would have to do with um, uh, really uh, two things. One of these things are, are configuration, right? So uh, when you buy these uh, software uh, packages, they're very general. And if you want them to be very usable for your clients, uh, you have to you have to fill out a bunch of uh, tables, or uh, you have to uh, uh, you have to you have to author a bunch of XML documents or uh, something like that. You have to give it information about how your organization is going to use it. So even if you're gonna you're not going to write the underlying software from scratch. Um, there's still going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, coding, uh, that goes into configuration. Then, uh, one of the things they talk about in the book is this glue code, right? You're going to have to write code, um, uh, at the edges of this application. It has to integrate with your other applications, okay, regardless of, whether you wrote those other applications from scratch or 
you bought uh, those. So there's a lot of code to be written uh, to implement the interfaces, the automatic interfaces between the target application that you're acquiring here and your other applications. Okay, so a lot of construction. Change management. Um, what they're talking about here is you need to change your organization, right? Every time you think about a system solution, uh, you also have to think about what has to go on in the business. And again, by business, I don't only mean for-profit capitalistic opportunities, but whatever your organization uh, does, higher education, scientific research, um, um, uh, state and local government, right? You've got people who are doing something that your organization is in a steady state, okay? Every time we we have a project where we're going to change some kind of a system solution, that means that when we adopt it, we're going to have to change some part of the business to capitalize on that new software. Okay, well that's not, that's easier said than done. Okay, and managing that is what they're getting at by uh, the phrase change management deployment okay so we are going to have to go and we're going to have to deploy the system okay that might mean we have to deploy hardware uh that might mean um we have to train uh people all those kinds of things oh here's the glue code uh, it, 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 it itself and then maintenance now here's the thing that people sometimes forget okay uh, when you buy a software package okay ideally you want to buy it from a vendor who's going to maintain that over time so let's say that you you acquire um version uh 13.1 okay well if this is a good uh, product that they maintained maintain all the time then there's going to be a 13.2 and a 13.3 and eventually there's going to be a 14 okay all these things that we build all the configurations that we build all the glue code that we build um all of these things integrate with whatever version we bought okay so every time there's a new release we have to go and take all the additional code that we've written and make sure that it works with the new release it's a lot of work okay it's not as much as uh having to maintain the whole product but it's not an insignificant at all okay okay so let's see we're talking about these erp implementation activities they have their uh, construction, their glue code, their change management, their deployment, uh, their maintenance. And they have like uh, um, subtests under each of these, right? So uh, these ERP systems have more than one application. They're highly integrated. They're a big deal. They're a lot of work. Uh, so doing these kinds of activities would be a lot of work but even if you're just buying uh, a payroll system right all these things have to be done for the payroll system okay um so here's the justification that we might use for licensing licensing commercial commercially available software solutions okay um we might say that the shared development and maintenance uh should lead to shared and therefore lower uh costs and that makes sense right there may be some 
there may be some um there may be some activities that take a lot of software um take a lot of software uh, development and maintenance effort uh and uh sort of every company has to do them right the ones the the sort of low hanging fruit of commercial software package opportunities where these horizontal kind of applications like um, uh, payroll and uh, 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 general ledger, those uh, kinds of things, uh, uh, accounts receivable, accounts uh, payable, right? And the, the idea was um, if we were going to create one ourselves, we would have a lot of costs and a lot of ongoing maintenance work. And then uh, they wouldn't really, you know, to be able to do uh, payroll well is good. Um, is that what's going to make a company successful? Mm, probably not. Uh, probably doing it poorly is going to make them unsuccessful. The same for the accounting things, right? Uh, so, uh, for some of these things, especially these wide horizontal solutions, you can really see how the how that uh, the rationale is. You know, we're all going to buy uh, the same uh, package or one of three or five or eight, and we're going to spread the costs out over all the users, um, and it, it's going to be a rational thing uh, to do. Uh, costs are more uh, predictable, right? So when you're buying these solutions from outside, okay, um, you, you kind of squeeze some of the risk out, right? Um, you can probably see from the fact that other companies are using these, that they're Oh, that they're viable, right? Um, you can get a quote on how much it's going to cost you. Uh, you can get a contract uh, to control your costs. Okay, so could you do better um, on your own, doing your own uh, custom uh, job? Maybe, but there's a risk there. Um, you lower your risk. Uh, because prior users have have already gone through the pain, right? If you're, let's say you're buying a payroll system and you're the 4,000th uh, company <laughs> to do it, it's not that nobody has gone through the suffering of, of this uh, software package as new software that's unproven. It's just been done by people before you, okay? Yeah, um, in theory, you get uh, faster access to a functioning system, okay? The idea is, yeah, you're going to have to take the, t the time to configure it, um, and you're going to have to do, oh, you're going to have to construct the glue code and you're going to have to do all that kind of stuff, but it's going to be faster than if you wrote it yourself from scratch, if you designed it and wrote it yourself from scratch. Um, one of the things I think they talk about pretty thoughtfully in the text is um, one of the rationales that people use about adopting software <laughs> packages is getting access to best practices. So the vendors will say that their software supports the best practices in the industry. And uh, one of the questions that they ask is, well, if everybody has access to these, are they really the best or have they become the average? Right? And I think that's, uh, that's uh, a sort of an interesting question, but uh, the fact is, for organizations, 
that uh, feel that they don't do a good job in this area already. Um, maybe what they're not saying is that they're adopting the best uh, practices, but uh, maybe uh, better uh, practices than they have already, right? So certainly that's a lot more reasonable expectation. Um, or you could see uh, the choice of this uh, software as a competitive necessity. Um, I can see that really in two different ways you could think of it that way. One way is uh, all of your competitors are already using, or a lot of your competitors are already using this uh, software uh, package. Their customers have come to expect the benefits that come from that, and you need to catch up, right? The other thing is um, everything that we build from scratch is going to absorb a lot of company time, money, and attention. So if we're going to buy these things from the outside and we're going to absorb less time, money and attention from the organization, well, then maybe we'll have the time, the money, the attention to turn to uh, other competitive pursuits. What about the costs of these commercially available software solutions? Um, there are non-trivial acquisition and ongoing licensing uh, costs, uh, plus the costs uh, for hiring a competent, a competent implementation uh, partner. Uh, so uh, the vendors are not giving these things away. OK, so um, if these things uh, cost hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars to buy a license uh, to, at least for big organizations. Okay, and then on top of that, um, it's not uncommon for the buyer to have to go and buy additional services from the vendor or, for, or from some uh, consulting or other kind of partner who's going to help them do the configuration um, and the glue code and all that kind of stuff. Um, one cost is that shared best practices might end up being a road to mediocrity, which is if we decide that we're not going to do this uh, particular thing, whatever it is, our own way, and do it the best, be better than all of our competitors, okay, if we just say, well, we'll get the software uh, package and we'll do what everybody else does, um, well, we're not going to distinguish ourselves, okay? And that's okay if this isn't the place where we want to shine, okay? But if it is a place where we want to shine, uh, we, uh, that might be a loss for us to go with the package. Um, the next one I think is really uh, thoughtful. A large-scale enterprise system might create an incentive to increase complexity unnecessarily. So um, all these uh, software packages, especially, you know, the big ones, those enterprise, uh, you know, ERP, blah, blah, blah uh, stuff, um, they're very general. It, it, they're meant to you know, to, to, to apply across a lot of industries. They have a lot of modules that you can turn on and off. Uh, if you have a lean and mean operation, okay, adopting some kind of a very general package and having to change, having to change your organization uh, to be consistent with it, 
you may essentially be detuning your organization, right? So you may be making it more complex, less responsive, more bloated than it would be um, if you left it alone, okay? Known usability uh, challenges. Um, I, uh, most, uh, most, uh, the complaints that I have are, uh, in the universities where I've worked, uh, to the extent that the universities have had these ERP kind of, uh, systems, um, a lot of the user interface that I've had the the chance to be exposed uh, to um, has have not really been that good. Uh, why why are the user interfaces of these kind of general uh, packages not good? Uh, because because they're a collection of features. Right there, there's the, the, it, typically there's this big aggregation of features, okay, and um, typically more features than any one a particular using organization needs, and so then a lot of times the user, uh, uh, you know, the secret of the user interface is how to find what you need and see of features that you don't need okay so that becomes that usability um, uh, problem is one of the prices of those big ERP systems now I'm sure if I were in an ERP uh, uh, vendor I would say well of course that happens but that only happens when people don't know how to configure the software and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you could, you know, you, you could say that that only happens, you know, to bad customers. But it's definitely a risk, okay? Uh, and the last one, dependence on the vendor and very high switching uh, costs, right? So, uh the more of your software uh, that comes from some other organization, the more uh, it, it dependent your organization is on that uh, vendor, right? And um, a little bit of that's okay. A whole lot of that is risky, right? Um, and it's very hard to switch, right? So we talked about, um, you know, you you have to buy the license, right? You have to do the configuration. You have to write all the glue code. Uh, you have to train all your people how to use the new software. And then you have to convert all of your data. So that the cost of switching from one of these like ERP vendors to another one, uh, they're prohibitively high, okay? So, um, you know, you can look at these and go, oh, this is great. We could squeeze all the risk out of, out of uh, the IT side of our business by buying things from the outside and not making any of them ourselves. And you would squeeze out uh, some of the risks, but a lot of the things that we're talking about here are more uh, risks that you acquire by having chosen, having chosen this uh, path, right? So there's no free lunch. Okay, now we haven't talked about open source software yet. So open source uh, software has been a movement that's been around uh, well over 20 years, probably closer to 30 years. Um, there's all kinds of software that uh, has this kind of licensing. Um, it's um, available to the users without 
direct monetary cost. So you typically don't have to pay a, a license uh, fee or a, an annual maintenance uh, fee. Uh, you typically get access uh, to the source code. Um, the requirement that you get from that is that the, uh, the license typically requires that if you make modifications that you have to make them available to others for free. Now that's not universal, okay? Um, there are uh, pretty typically, and uh, this is uh, true, if you create a commercial product on top of open source uh, software, then you have to make your, your code available for free. But uh, typically, uh, in my experience with the software that I use, if I'm an individual organization and I, um, I adopt an open source uh, product and I, I make modifications and I don't sell them to others, uh, I don't think that I'm required to uh, publish them. Um, so open source uh, software has been widely successful in the context of system uh, software. So uh, Linux is, is probably the prime example of that. Um, databases, MySQL, MariaDB, Hadoop, MongoDB, uh, other uh, uh, kind of big uh, data and analytics uh, software like Redis and Apache Spark. Um, the, it, the Apache web uh, uh, server. In fact, there's a whole bunch of... Um, there's a whole bunch of Apache uh, 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 projects that are not the Apache web uh, server that are good good examples of uh, really successful open source uh, software uh, products. Um, there are some really... <laughs> successful uh, software uh, development uh, tools and environments like uh, PHP, Python, Eclipse, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, um, uh, Django, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and some application software uh, packages have become relatively widely used in their specialized uh, categories. And two that they talk about in the text are Rapid, Miner, and uh, Sakai. And um, uh, so uh, you could easily find an open source uh, candidate, right? Uh, that's an alternative to uh, developing this software yourself or some kind of a commercial uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, software. Okay. Um, practical reality reality integrated systems. Uh, so the point he, uh, here is that even in a particular project, we, we typically don't pick one of these approaches to the exclusion of the others, even for one project. Typically, we do a little of this and a little of that and a little of the third thing. Okay, so in a great majority of organizations, any new systems capabilities have to be integrated with existing uh, uh, systems. 
The application portfolio of most modern organizations consists of software applications from a variety of different sources, integration of the different <laughs> components with uh, a variety of mechanisms such as glue code. So, uh, a given organization will have a portfolio of applications, okay, even individual applications. This is the point what I was uh, to, uh, trying to make a minute ago. Even individual applications are typically not just all uh, from uh, one source, right? So uh, it you might have uh, you might have a project in which you um, you can buy a software uh, package that will meet uh, sixty percent of the requirements, right? So uh, and maybe maybe you could do this maybe. 60% of the requirements could, could be met by a, a commercial package that we bought. 20% of the requirements could be handled by some open source uh, software that we're going to adopt. And then the rest uh, would all be custom code and uh, glue code. All right pretty typical uh, okay so even in a individual project it wouldn't be uncommon to find that we were using more than one software source okay um so uh there's a lot of integration that has to be done right so uh here's a neat oh we're talking about uh here are three organizations, right? And some of their stuff, they're going to uh, they're going to write from scratch because they need unique functionality. So we have an aircraft manufacturer. Let's make this a little bigger. Uh, there we go. So we have an aircraft manufacturer, an internet retailer, and an insurance brokerage. So what things would they build themselves? Well, let's see. In the aircraft one, wing and nacelle design and fabrication, um, complex supply chain management. Um, the internet retailer, the website fulfillment, that's where you fulfill orders and you ship the product out supplier management data mining and the insurance policy management and renewals uh risk analytics modeling employee level services now all three of them are kind of by some things uh with uh packages uh CRM, customer relationship management, sales management, general ledger, accounts payable, accounts receivable, etc. Right? So, um, uh, the scheme that we're talking about here is that organizations uh, will do well to be creating custom applications for the things where they expect themselves to be significantly different than their uh, competitors right this is where their this is where their differentiation and value added really expresses itself and then there's going to be a whole bunch of things in which um if we do these things with the same uh, tools that everybody else does uh, fine. You know, uh, general ledger, you know, 
do we want to have the best, uh, you know, uh, general ledger in the, uh, you know, in the aircraft manufacturing uh, industry? No, we just have one. We just we need one that you know that allows us to do everything that people in our industry do. Uh, if we're all doing it the same, we don't care, right? So that's the scenario that we're talking about here, okay? Um, that's the same slide because I made it bigger and now I can't get rid of it. So uh, this is an interesting slide. It's right from the text. Um, the idea here is that we want to have we want to think of ourselves as having a portfolio of applications, okay? And why do we call this a portfolio? Well, um, in financial management, okay, we started to talk about financial portfolios, uh, stock portfolios, um, um, financial asset portfolios, those kinds of, of things. And uh, it's it's been a, a kind of a powerful uh, concept in in the financial side of a business. So other sides have have you know sort of adopted this way of uh, kind of thinking and uh, talking. But the idea is, well, it's actually not that far from the idea that we had on the last uh, slide, which is. Uh, some of our things are, are going to be unique and some of our things are going to be uh, common, right? So what we're saying here is uh, oh, we've got uh, the CRM uh, sales uh, prospects in the ERP financials. These are probably going to be uh, common things. And... Um, Oh, some of these things are going to be specific to our own organization. Okay. Well, sorry about that. All right. Um, so, if we're going to have an organization in which we kind of think of, you know, large organizations do a lot of activities. We've come to expect a lot of uh, software, uh, a lot of uh, computer support for those those activities. Um, you could see kind of the pictures of of of, of the portfolios. Um, there's there's a lot uh, there. While then the organization has to go about managing that in a thoughtful way. Um, so it's important to maintain c control and understanding of the overall architecture of the solution. So the solution that you're going to do, okay, so you're going to do a project, okay, there is um, a problem or an opportunity or a group of problems or a group of opportunities uh, for the organization. And then you're going to have a system solution. It's going to have some architecture. Uh, okay. And by architecture, we might mean there are different parts that run on different computers that are coming from different sources, right? Well, this could be pretty uh, complex. You as the systems analysts have to understand it all and how it's going to fit uh, together. Um, you have to have an in-depth understanding of the technical mechanisms that are used for integrating the parts. Uh, uh, your, your organization have, has to have strong relationships with uh, the vendors of all the components so that the changes to the component systems don't cause avoidable surprises. Uh, and then you also have, have to have the ability to react in a flexible 
way to unavoidable surprises. So when we start looking at these system solutions as being a combination of things we make and we buy and we buy from different people, uh, or may, we may have some open source things, uh, this becomes a kind of complex ecosystem that uh, we need to understand as we're acquiring and developing the solution. And then over time, we need to monitor it. You know, every time there's a change in the environment, you know, regulatory uh, changes, uh, those kinds of things. Every time one one of the vendors that we're working with is going to release a new release of the underlying software. Uh, we have to kind of understand how that fits into what we're doing and make plans for that to work out well for our organization. Um, here we are. Uh, so, all that's pretty complex, right? The authors want us to think of one more level of uh, complexity, and that is uh, where are the people who are going to work on this? There's a history of calling the people who are going to work on things resources. Um, the Agile people uh, don't like that. They like to call them uh, people. Uh, but where are all the people going to come from? OK. Uh, so it, it, there are two uh, dimensions you have to think of. Uh, what type of contractual arrangement are we going to have with the people? Like, who do they work for? You know, do they work for us as employees or do they work for us as independent uh, contractor? Do we hire them through some kind of a consulting firm? And then where are they going to be? All right. For instance, the Agile people say that we want to have a small team. We want to have a smallish project. We want to have a small team. We want the business and the technical people co-located in the same place. Okay, and yet for some uh, projects, especially the big ones, we, we could likely have uh, people all over the world, right? So uh, what's, what kind of a contractual arrangement are we going to have with the people who work on this? And where are those people going to be? Okay, I'm still having a hard time getting from slide to slide. Uh, I apologize for that. So here are the kinds of contractual arrangements that you can have. You can hire salaried employees. You could hire independent uh, contractors. Uh, you could acquire uh, contractors through uh, professional services uh, firm. In some cases, the workers could be employees of that professional services firm, or they could be subcontractors of that professional services uh, firm. Um, you could outsource uh, the development activities to uh, some kind of uh, some kind of a uh, services uh, provider. Uh, you could use uh, consulting uh, services. So you could use an outsourcing firm. You could use a consulting firm. Now, let's talk about hiring salaried employees, OK? Uh, what's good about that? Well, stability of the workforce in general, the stability of teams, learning to know your staff well, developing a good understanding of what teams can achieve, predictable staff availability, employee loyalty, OK? disadvantages while well, lack of flexibility you only have the people that you have uh, inability to react quickly to changes in the uh, technology and also uh, big changes in uh, demand for you know for labor like all of a sudden you have to do one more big system 
are you going to go hire another 40, 50 people to do it? And then what are you going to do with them when the, the project's over? Um, it can potentially be more expensive than, than buying help from the outside when you calculate the total costs of employees and their pensions and their benefits and all those uh, kinds of things. And then um, uh, even if you're hiring, your, uh, even if you hire your own people, you can easily get to the point that you've got a lot of people who know X, but the project that, you know, that you need to do, they need to know why. Okay. Um, where are we? What about hiring independent uh, contractors? Um, so these are people, uh, who are part of the gig economy, right? Um, they are individual professionals who provide their services in a series of short-term assignments. Although some of them might hang around one, uh, particular organization a lot. So it's not uncommon for organizations to have a contractor or two or five or 10 uh, who've been hanging around for years and years. Um, they're not employees of the organization who are developing the software. Um, there's a big issue in the US of uh, who's an employee and who's a contractor, right? And so there's, there's all this sort of legalese that has to do with um, if uh, if the client is controlling the details of how the services are performed, then the government may consider that the contractor to be an employee of the client. Um, even though that's not what the relationship is on its face. Advantages, flexibility, well-defined total costs, um, ability to staff up to meet a short-term uh, need, disadvantages, missing the benefits of long-term employment, leading to lack of loyalty, lower team stability, and the ability to learn as a team, higher turnover costs, etc. That's not what I wanted to do. Let's try that. Now, uh, you can use people from the outside and not be hiring people for gig work yourself you can you can go find uh some kind of a professional services uh firm i work for a firm like this uh uh that hires uh the workers and you as the organization who's uh building the software um you you make a deal with a professional services firm and they they provide uh the workers when you need them uh, you don't have the problem that uh, the government can come along and say, even though you've hired this person as a, uh, a contractor, we're going to treat them as an employee, okay? If you're hiring people through a professional services firm, uh, you really don't have that risk. Uh, and the unit costs are higher. The unit costs are higher because you're not only... Uh, 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 paying the worker, but you're paying the professional services firm as well. And hopefully they're, they're providing some value. This is driving me nuts. And if it's driving you nuts, I apologize. Okay, so all the stuff that we've talked about in the last couple of slides has to do with uh, if we're going to create the software ourselves, where are we going to get the labor? Okay, what if we want to outsource this? So what if we want, we want to get the benefits of somebody having 
a created software for us um, and perhaps even operated it, um, what if we want to do outsourcing? Okay, so uh, in outsourcing, larger segments of IT work are contracted to a service provider as an alternative to its own employees performing the work. Okay, typically we have uh, contracts for this that are called service level agreements. A broad range of capabilities can be outsourced. Infrastructure, maintenance, develop, development, analytics. In development, it's typical to, <laughs> to outsource maintenance and continuing uh, development of older parts of the application so that the, to, so that the company can focus on new uh, development. So uh, take the old systems that are kind of managing themselves, uh, give them to some kind of outsourcing firm, uh, get some kind of a price tag for that, and then uh, take your people and go build the new systems. Okay, and there are a lot of firms who do this kind of outsourcing, including Accenture, IBM, Capgemini, Infosys, and the rest that you see here. Uh, so the other thing that we can do, you can get help from the outside is uh, consulting. So while outsourcing, uh, we focus on providing specific services based on a service level agreement and consulting, the emphasis is more on guidance regarding performance improvement and future focused uh, capabilities. Now, when they're talking about here, I think they're talking about kind of management consulting uh, companies. These are people who come in and uh, work with senior management with the idea that they'll improve the business. Uh, okay, and part of those Part of the changes will be changes in systems, but a significant part will be changes in uh, kind of work approaches, uh, work organization, financial changes, and all those kinds of things. Um, this kind of consulting is more open-ended and less tightly specified than outsourcing. Um, and a larger part of the overall IT team is external than in outsourcing. Okay. Placement of resources. So where are these people going to be? So you don't only have to think about who are they going to work for, but where are they going to be? Are they going to be on site? You know, uh, are they going to be, uh, and if you're a large organization, what is on site? Okay, do you only have one site? So on site of which of your sites? Uh, okay, uh, you might be doing onshore outsourcing. So you, you might be outsourcing your IT work to a company that is located in your uh, country. Um, you might be doing nearshoring, which is you're going to outsource your IT work for to a company in a nearby country, or offshoring, uh, outsourcing your IT work to a company far away, uh, maybe on the other side of the globe. Uh, and we also have this approach that a lot of big uh, companies have done where they will create a captive unit. So they'll have a division of their company uh, that's responsible for IT things that is located offshore, typically I've heard of 
divisions like this in places like Ireland or Eastern Europe or India, uh, uh, where uh, we're not working with another uh, company because it's it's a unit of our company, but it's not located with us. So in essence, we all work for the same people, um, but we're different uh, uh, divisions, let's say. Um, so there's certainly a movement toward workers being more uh, dispersed. Uh, and this this has been, I think, emphasized by the recent uh, pandemic, where uh, uh, even groups of people who all used to work uh, together in an office are largely working from home. Um, so if we're going to take some of our work and distribute it around the world, well, how could that provide advantages? Well, it gives us the ability to benefit from lower labor costs. So that's a benefit to ownership and management, but not particularly to employees. Uh, it gives us access to larger pools of resources, and by resources, read people. Uh, it will broaden the organization's understanding of cultural and political environments. Uh, so to do this well, I think you need to be a more sophisticated organization uh, culturally and uh, politically. So yeah, that could maybe work to your benefit in other areas of your organization's interest. Um, and um, <laughs> to the extent that you can take a part of your, your work, your IT work, uh, and give it to some other organization, well, then you get to concentrate on the things that you want to concentrate on. Now, what what are the downsides of uh, taking a part of your IT work and sending it to some other part of the world? Well, the lack of face-to-face -face or sometimes any type of synchronous communication, if we're working with people on the other side of the world uh, exactly, well, then uh, they're asleep when we're awake and we're asleep when they're awake and the only time to even talk on zoom is for somebody to not be getting their sleep okay it's an exaggeration but you know what i mean uh a creation of trusting personal relationships is more uh difficult uh but it can be rewarding too i mean uh Working with people from a different place who are maybe culturally different is uh, challenging, uh, but when it works out well, it's very rewarding. So uh, uh, it has a potential high side as well. Uh, functional specifications become essential, uh, but are more difficult to write. Okay, now I don't really know what he's getting at, at there, but as soon as you take, let's say we're working on a development project, okay? Uh, if we're taking a plan-driven approach, okay, and we are documenting the specifications, you know, the requirements and the design, if we are documenting that on paper, well, then it's a lot easier to share with other groups of people wherever they may be, uh, especially helpful for people who are uh, on the other side of the world, right? So, um, uh, but if we're taking an agile approach, okay, and uh, the, uh, 
the expression of the requirements and the expression of the overall uh, design is very lightweight. Okay, and we're expecting to flesh out the requirements and the design during uh, during sprints in which we're you know, we're actually going to be building the product. Uh, that seems less feasibly done uh, when, say, the programmers are on the other side of the world. Okay, so one big issue uh, for the Agile uh, people is a co-located team, okay? So one of the things you have to think about here is to the extent that you want to take a part of your work and send it some to some other more affordable labor market, okay? Uh, well, maybe you're, maybe you're not going to do that with Agile, okay? Maybe you're going to do that. I think it would be challenging enough to do that uh, with a highly documented, plan-driven kind of uh, approach. Uh, okay, so this is where some of these kind of economic uh, decisions start to drive your decisions about how you're going to organize your work on the project. Uh, you could have higher coordination costs, so people flying back and forth and that kind of stuff, and potential security risks. So, um, you know, to the extent that you've got people who are working on your systems that are not under your immediate control, and maybe you didn't hire them, um, or you didn't vet them and all that kind of stuff, well, uh, you know, uh, Security uh, breaches can be very expensive. Um, so here's a couple slides on managing your vendor relationships, okay? And uh, if you're not going to do all the work yourself, okay, uh, and over the course of the chapter, we've really been talking about how you might do it with your organization in combination with others. Then you've really got to, you have to choose the others. You have to choose the vendors very carefully. And you maybe want to invest in a relationship with them that will maximize the outcome. So the kinds of things that you might be thinking of are how to select the vendors, what kind of contracts you should have with them, and then kind of what I was talking about when I did the intro here, how to build a long-term relationship with a vendor. So selecting the vendor. Uh, the process, as we'd like to tell you, is... Uh, you have to make a, a determination that a third-party solution should be used via selection and configuration rather than developing it yourself through construction, right? So that's the first part. You make the decision to do that. Now, the next thing is you do is you identify potential vendor uh, candidates. And you really want to do this yourself because if you're going to have several vendors compete for the business, you want to make sure that you have all the credible ones in the process. So identifying the credible ones is important to you. You don't want to expect all of them to find you Maybe some of them will find you, but some of those you may have to contact yourself. Uh, you need to articulate the required services in some kind of a, a, a bidding kind of a document, an RFP, a request for proposal, uh, or a request for information in RFI. You have to do initial evaluation of the proposals that you receive. Um, what we typically do is 
is that we want to create a short list of vendors in which we're going to invest more time. Uh, okay. And then we typically invite them to make presentations and product demonstrations. Uh, and then from that, we select the winner. Okay. And then we have to negotiate the contract. So selecting a vendor, what kind of criteria should we look for? Uh, we should be looking for the quality, the fit, and the growth paths of the solution architecture. Okay. Uh, we should be looking for the reputation of the vendor and their financial viability. Uh, we certainly don't want to sign up with a vendor who already has unhappy uh, clients or even one that has happy uh, clients if they're about to go out of business. Uh, we want to know what their support capabilities are. Typically things like uh, uh, how quickly are they going to... Uh, 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 how quickly are we going to get their attention when we have a problem? Is there a cultural fit? Uh, what's what's the vendor's approach uh, to tailored solutions and version management? Some software vendors expect the companies or the organizations that use their software uh, to tailor it to you you know to uh, change it okay and they release new versions of, of their software to make it easy for their clients to incorporate the new version of the software into the tailored solution that the client has other companies they want you to use it as is and they're not going to give you a lot of support for uh, tailoring okay you should know that up front uh, Vendors track record in implementation. Uh, how long does it typically uh, take to get a new client up on this application? Uh, are they good at it? Okay. Are recent, are recent new customers happy with how well the implementation went? Um, Vendor size and power uh, compared to the potential uh, client. And this is, I, I think, a very thoughtful uh, comment. Um, the power in these relationships shifts over time. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, when, when you are in an organization who wants to make a major purchase like this, in the beginning, you have all the money and you have all the power, okay? And anybody who wants to do business with you has to, has, has to find a way to make you happy. On the other hand, as soon as you commit to and pay for a big solution like this, okay, uh, well then, uh, the vendor has a lot of power, right? Uh, so... You, one of the things that, could, that contracts uh, do is that they help you manage that power shift over time, okay? And uh, as, a, as a customer, I think you want a vendor that's big enough that uh, they can get the job done for you, but not so big that you're, if they don't really care. You know, if you go away, uh, they don't care. Okay, so you want to be, um, there's a, you know, if there's a kind of ideal size, you know, if they're too small, they're going to blink out. You know, if they're too big, maybe you're not a big part of their business and they aren't all that interested in uh, keeping you happy. So the relative size and, and power of the organizations is pretty important stuff. Uh, now there, there are a lot of different kinds of contracts that are entered into for these, you know, for software and, uh, services, right? So for application software development and 
maintenance, uh, you could make a deal for a fixed price, or you could do time in materials. Okay, so it's much easier to get a fixed price from a vendor when um, what they're going to deliver is highly specified. Okay, if what they're going to have to do and deliver uh, is going to be determined by work that we're going to do collectively in the future, uh, then they're going to be more likely to say, well, we'll, we'll charge you on the basis of the services that you use. That would be the time and materials, right? Um, so I think a good way to think about these uh, contract forms is this. Um, I think that having a fixed price-ish kind of contract for a highly specific uh, purchase is good for for the vendor and good for, for the customer. I think that uh, I think that projects where the customer wants to keep control and we're going to determine what's going to be built as we go. I think the time and materials kind of approach uh, favors everybody, right? So I think you want a contract form that's going to follow the nature of the relationship and the type of uh, project that you're going to do. Um, uh, if you're going to buy uh, some kind of enterprise system or other third-party software, something like an ERP, uh, that's going to be a major purchase and it's going to be a very complicated uh, contract. Um, you could have a cloud infrastructure uh, contract for it to give you access to to computing that you might use for the development and for the deployment. In cloud infrastructure contracts, there's a lot of uh, providers. Uh, there's quite a bit of competition. So I think you could bid that out and get a pretty uh, competitive uh, deal. Uh, so, um, what to think about here? Uh, well, we've got this whole chapter summary here, which I'm going to leave for you to read on your own. So, um, again, in this uh, course, the current uh, teaching is, is the fall of 2021. I've really used this uh, chapter seven as a uh, uh, sort of in place of uh, chapter two. We're going on to chapter two next week. But um, so we've kind of jumped into the middle of the textbook, but there's a reason for that. And that is, um, unless you have a good lay of the land about all the different ways that you could either develop or acquire software, unless you have your eye open for all those opportunities, it's kind of hard to focus on what exactly your project is going to be. Uh, because uh, projects in, in which we are, um, in which we are going to, uh, we're going to uh, develop the software f from scratch are, are really quite different from ones where we're going to acquire a software a package and we're going to tailor and uh, configure it, right? Um, and different, again, from uh, solutions like, say, salesforce.com, uh, where there's there's an application as a service and we're just going to write a, co a contract and we're going to turn on a thousand seats of uh, salesforce.com. Uh, so, uh, I really think it's important for you to be kind of thinking about all these, you know, kind of macro decisions about what exactly shape this project is going to take uh, up front. Okay. 
because what the systems analyst is going to do is going to depend on exactly the approach that we're going to take. All right, so uh, this is a little bit out of order in the text, but I'm going to claim that you're going to thank me later. And with that, I'm going to say bye, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.